was an atmosphere like that. In the upper room with 120 of Christ's closest followers that made room for Holy Spirit to fall and turn the world upside down that day. Amen. Amen. And the same is available for us today. As believers in Jesus Christ, that same ability to move by the power of the Spirit is available. We just so often don't tap in. I want to talk to you about the world turned on its head. I believe that's the message that the Lord would say. Carrie, if your kids, if your grandkids want to go to kids' church, you know where it is, right? You can take them. I see the rest of the kids in our being moved. So they might enjoy that. It's been wonderful to have 14 children in our midst today. Yes. Thank you, Lord. And I believe the Lord is saying something about growth. And we need to have our ears attuned to him. We've been praying. We've been praying and fasting for the last 10 days. And so I know what the Lord has been saying here. I'm sure he said things to you at home as well. Um, I was hoping to be able to share some of that. Uh, is there anybody quickly who has a testimony of what the Lord has said? Very quickly, very briefly. I think the mic is back there by you, Rick. Is the mic back by you? Anybody? Okay, Cheryl Moonen wants to say something. Um, on Thursday, I got to move us from the doctor that I'm supposed to have back surgery on the middle of my back, but the MRI that they did um, encompassed my whole spine, so they saw a problem in my neck that had been taken care of seven years ago that never healed, and all the screws that they put in are all now floating around in my spine at the top of my neck, and so now they're determining that that's more important, and they're ordering more MRIs and, and CAT scans to be done. Um, sort of like a pass for the doctor to know what he's doing when he does the surgery. Well, I called here the other night and interrupted prayer, not realizing that, that they were praying at that time. And they all came to the office and prayed for me over the phone. And I honestly believe that um, God's touched my neck and that I received the healing Amen. and will not need to have any surgery in my neck. Mm -hmm. Um, I am being scheduled for the MRI and the CAT scan. Um, hopefully, we'll see proof of that, mm -hmm. medical proof of that. So, mm -hmm. praise God. Praise God. So, I was encouraging you to pray for one another. So, let's just continue to believe in faith for Cheryl's body. Throughout the um, fast and prayer, God just can be. Um, when, when God wants us to do something, He always has promise after that. And He said in John, "Remain in Me, and I in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, but won't, but must remain in Me. Remain in the vine, so neither can, neither can you unless you remain in Me. So we will bear much fruit if we remain in Him. So just remain in Him." Mm -hmm. There was such a sense of unity and refreshing as we prayed together. Um, I believe God is going to break through and and uh, carry us forward. So, you know, I have to tell you, I've been working in the garden this week. You are all so kind. Not one of you has said anything about me not wearing eye makeup or having this big old puffy eye here. So thank you very much. I don't like working in the garden, and that's one of the reasons I have reactions. Um, Pastor Don will tell you when we travel that uh, if I get bit by mosquitoes, I welt. She does nothing. In fact, they don't even bother her. But I welt terribly. I have these allergic reactions. And so I don't like working in the garden. 
What I do like is the way the Lord is so faithful to speak to me when I'm in the garden. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. You know, I'm doing something I don't want to do, and yet the Lord is faithful. Mm -hmm. And he's speaking to me throughout that. And I also like to eat the fresh produce. Mm -hmm. I mean, who doesn't? Yeah. You know, the things we get in the grocery store, it's like, is this even food? You know? Um, I love to eat the, the fresh produce. Mm -hmm. Well, so I had some um, little plantings that I planted, but I also planted some seed. And you know, on each one of the seed packets, there's directions. Plant it this deep, this far apart, it needs full sun or part sun. You know, you need to water it X amount of time. It also tells us which climates it's good for. Because we know in northern Minnesota, there's not much space between spring and winter. Mm -hmm. We've seen that this year even. Had a couple of nights where it was only 40. But it's understand, it's, I need to understand what the conditions are for planting a successful crop. And I need to plant it at just the right time. You see, if I plant too early, I risk frost. If I plant too late, I risk frost. Minnesota, frost, 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 frost. Mm -hmm. You know, I need to plant it at just the right time. This is God's plan for nature. Everything has a proper time for a successful harvest. He never plants or plans a failed crop. Mm -hmm. God never plans for failure. There is always success in him. This is true for his plan in spiritual things as well as in, na in nature. He's orchestrated all things to produce a fruitful harvest. Mm -hmm. That's his plan. He wants a harvest. He's a God of order. He orchestrates everything. So even in life, what may seem like a coincidence is oftentimes just a part of God's plan. He's yeah. just moving. Yes. And when we move, according to his plan, in his way, with his power, there's always an abundant harvest. Amen. Always, when we move his way. We see this in Pentecost. He turned the world on their heads, and he wants to do the same today, here, in this church, and for our visitors watching, in your church, for our people online, in your church. God wants to do the same. He's coming again. Yes. And he wants a harvest. Yes. He doesn't want us sitting on our on our seats. He doesn't want us sitting on our seats or on our hands or having our hands in our pockets. Amen. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's pretty comfortable to do that. Because mm -hmm. that means no commitment on your part. You just wait and see what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I'm not moving my hands until I see God move. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what? Take your hands out of your pocket and you'll see God move. Amen. Period. We need to be able to take our hands out of our pockets. Acts 2.41 says, So then, those who had received Peter's word were baptized, and there were added that day to their number about 3,000 souls. 3,000. You know, my first crusade I preached, I was scared to death. Mm -hmm. And I think there were five people who came forward. Well, God rejoices in the five people. Yes, right. I can't imagine my first sermon yielding 3,000 souls. Mm -hmm. Wow. That would have been amazing. Yes. And I'm sure they were amazed. And Peter, I'm sure, like me, said, I didn't do a thing. I just followed the Spirit. Mm -hmm. You know? <coughs> so what is Pentecost? Acts 2.1 says... And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. They were all in one place because at the ascension, Jesus told them to not leave Jerusalem until they had been endued with power from on high. They were obedient to his command. Amen. Pentecost simply means 50. 50 days from Passover, 50 days from the Feast of First Fruits. We see it in Leviticus 23. You know, it's important we understand the entire Bible matters. The Old Testament is a foreshadowing of Jesus. Amen. If we don't understand where it comes from, we don't understand the fullness in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Because it's rich with promise. Mm -hmm. 
So Leviticus 23, starting at verse 9. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you enter the land which I am going to give you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring in the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord for you to be accepted. On that day after the Sabbath, the priest shall bring an offering. Its grain offering shall then be two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering by fire to the Lord for a soothing aroma, with its drink offering a fourth of a hin of wine. Until this same day, until you have brought in the offering of your God, you shall all your dwelling places. You shall also count for yourselves from that day after the Sabbath, from the day when you brought in the sheaf of the wave offering, there shall be seven complete Sabbaths. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring in from your dwelling places two loaves of bread for a wave offering, made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be a fine flour, baked with leaven, as first fruits to the Lord. So this Shavuot, which means weeks, or Pentecost is. Mm -hmm. It was, there were three required feasts for the men of Torah. Pentecost was one of those required feasts. Simply what that means is no matter where in the known world you live, you needed to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Quite the celebration. In Torah, it was a festival of nature as it was celebrating the first harvest of wheat. So sometimes in the Bible we'll even see it referred to as the Feast of Harvest. It was also recognized as the day in which Moses had received the law on Sinai. We see in this, fest in this festival the faithfulness of God providing the early harvest and the hopefulness mm -hmm. for a later, more abundant harvest. Feast. The book of Ruth is traditionally read in synagogue because the events of Ruth took place during the harvest. Theologian um, Booker says the reason they read this is because Ruth is an illustration and a celebration of someone from another nation coming in and, and receiving back on their old ways and cementing themselves to the new. Right. So this book is read. This festival is a foreshadowing of the outpouring of Holy Spirit that we see in Acts 2, 41, where 3,000 people were added to their number that day. This outpouring is called the early rain, and the latter rain will come towards the end times. You can see Joel, Zechariah, and even in James. So 1,500 years prior to Pentecost, God gave Moses the law written on tablets of stone. But in Pentecost, we in Holy Spirit are a more perfect covenant. Ezekiel 36, 24 to 28 says this, I will take you from the nations, and I will gather you from all the lands, and I will bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all of your filthiness and from all of your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from you, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you, and I will cause you to walk in all of my statutes, and you will be careful to observe all of my ordinances. And you will live in the land that I gave your forefathers. So you will be my people, and I will be your God. That's the Amen. promise. Amen. Amen. Prophesied before Pentecost ever even happened mm -hmm. that this would happen. So this ingathering, I just want to um, <coughs> turn to Acts 2. Keep in and out of Acts 2, um, just because I feel like this is what the Lord is saying to do. So I'm going to start at verse 37. It says, Now when they heard this, 
whoever was listening to Peter's sermon, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then, those who received his word were baptized, and that day were about 3,000 souls added. You see, when the truth of God resonates within your being, you ask this question, what am I going to do about this, Lord? What do I do? Or you might even ask a friend, like, I don't know what to do about this. Because the truth has pierced our heart. Peter guided them into their first step of relationship with Christ. He says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. Sometimes we need to just go back to the beginning and remind ourselves about our relationship with Christ, about what he has done. You see, when God pricks our heart, we need to know there's forgiveness. Whether we've just received Christ, whether we know Christ and he's pricked us about some sin that we've done, or some attitude we've had, we need to know there's that forgiveness. Free. Free. He gives that. See, not only do you see and receive forgiveness, but he puts you back into your proper place in relationship with him. And he gives you his Holy Spirit to lead and to guide you. Peter kept encouraging them with his testimony. You know, essentially he was saying, get out of the world. Get out of your mind. Be in the mind of Christ. You have the mind of Christ if you know Christ. Get out of the world. <coughs> You know, we have an inner knowing when we're hanging out with the wrong people. We have an inner knowing when we're doing the wrong things. That's, that's God. And he's saying, I don't want that for you. But you know, sometimes we're so into self-satisfaction that we just say, well, I'm, I'm going to do it anyhow. I'll just repent later. You know, we, we have this attitude of cheap grace. Well, there's no such thing. It costs Jesus Christ his life. Amen. That sin that you want to do is costing Jesus Christ his life. Amen. Amen. So listen to that inner witness who says, don't do that. Really, don't do that. We understand deep in our heart. Because God wants to talk to us. And I'll tell you, if he stopped talking, oh, wow, you're in trouble. If you don't hear that inner witness of don't do that, you're in trouble because God has given you over to your sin. He doesn't want that. You see, what he wants is he wants to transform our lives from the garbage heap to the throne room. Too many of us live in that garbage heap. And we say, well, I'm a Christian. And yet our life will not ever display that. And Holy Spirit says, I want to take you from there and I want to put you in your rightful place as a believer in Jesus Christ. Amen. So get out of the garbage heap. And 3,000 responded to that message that day. 3,000 wanted to get out of the garbage heap and into the throne room. You see, what would have happened had Peter and the others not Spent that time in the upper room listening. Mm -hmm. What would have happened? You see, personal charm is not enough to make a lasting change in someone's life. Mm -hmm. Now we have... Mm, <laughs> we have charmers in our world. We have people who just have such natural charisma that people want to follow them. It's a cheap message. It's easy to do. I can say a couple of different things I might call my mantra or mantra. But it's cheap 
and it will never make an inter eternal difference in someone's life. We need a real move of Holy Spirit, and it's going to take that time yes. of being in the upper room. Yes, Lord. You see, to preach a message with eternal results takes the presence and the power of an eternal being living within. Amen. If there's anything said today that makes an eternal difference in your life, it's not because they were words that I said. It's because the Holy Spirit has talked to you and convicted you and said, wake up. It has nothing to do with me mm -hmm. other than it's my mouth his message is going through. Mm -hmm. But this is all for him. Mm -hmm. There is a prerequisite for an in-gathering. Mm -hmm. Tell me, what was essential to the occurrence of Holy Spirit baptism? What was essential? What did they have to have? Repentance? Anything else? They had to have a desire for the Holy Spirit? Is that what you said? Okay. They might not have known about Holy Spirit at that point, but they had a desire for the things of God. They had a desire to know Christ better. They had a desire to be obedient to Christ. They had a desire to be in unity. Acts 2.1 says, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Mm. All together in one place. They were operating as one unit. Mm. You know, for anyone who's been in the armed forces during the time of war, you have to operate as one unit. There has to be one commander, and you have to move forward together. Mm. Or you're going to get slaughtered. Mm. They were in unison. And what were they doing? Acts 1.14 tells us they were all with one mind, continually devoting themselves to prayer. It's not up there. I didn't give that one to Heidi. Mm -hmm. They were all with one mind, continually devoting themselves to prayer. You see, we must create an atmosphere where Holy Spirit is welcome. If we're going to do our own thing, our same old way, he's going to say, okay, you, you got this. I'll just sit over here until you're ready to say, okay, you want, I want to do business with you. Otherwise, we're always going to just stay where we are, stuck. We need to create an atmosphere where he is welcome. So why were the apostles and followers there in that upper room? They were waiting. They were focused on Jesus. They were obedient to Jesus. You see, Acts 1.18 says, I mean, sorry, Acts 1.8 says they were waiting for the Holy Spirit who would bring power when he came upon them to be Christ's witnesses to the world. Again, they didn't yet know it was Holy Spirit, but they knew that Jesus told them to wait. Let's go to Acts 2, starting with verse 2. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves as they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Mm -hmm. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together. And they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and they were astonished, saying, Why, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear them in our own language, in our own tongue to which we are born? Parthians and Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues speaking the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity. 
perplexity, mm -hmm. saying to one another, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. But others were mocking and saying, they're just full of sweet wine. <laughs> Don't listen to them. I just sipped from the bottle a few too many times. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. Wow. I understand there was a fierce storm this last week. I wasn't here. I was down in southern Minnesota. Um, but Rick told me trees were down. Debris was everywhere. There was even a possible tornado in Hackensack. I don't know. There was lightning and thunder. An amazing, awesome, and terrible storm. Wow. And yet, it doesn't even compare to the Holy Spirit. It was just the only way they had to describe what was happening. You know, but Holy Spirit is not terrible. Holy Spirit is able. He gives you ability to do what he needs you to do. Amen. He came in power and in might. But because he had never come that way before, they had no context in which to describe that. Mm -hmm. So it's described in what we would think as a storm, how we would describe a storm. Wow. This power was felt by all of the 120 in the room. All of them. Every single one of them felt it. And each one received as the Spirit gave them words. Each one. He doesn't hold back. He gives to all equally. Do you remember why there was a need for these tongues? Why was there a need for the tongues? Because there were people from all over the world there. Absolutely. People from all over the world. People from every nation. Followers of Torah. And using Old Testament scriptures, or Torah... Peter describes the prophetic coming of Christ being fulfilled right at that very moment. Mm. Just want to read a couple of verses out of this midsection that I won't go to. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. Men of Israel. This is from Peter's preaching. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene. A man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God, God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. This Jesus, God raised again. And we are all witnesses to that. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of Holy Spirit, he has poured forth, which you both see and hear. Wow. Wow. So using the Old Testament scriptures that you can read, that your homework, Peter proclaims who Jesus is and how the Old Testament scriptures were fulfilled by Christ. They, Peter, once the denier of Christ, was now the proclaimer of Christ, the living Christ. He was now empowered to proclaim that name, that person. And the listeners, pierced to the heart, responded to the message. 3,000 gathered in. What a harvest. Mm -hmm. I believe God wants us to have a harvest, but we need to know how to steward an ingathering. Mm -hmm. You know, God gives us things, and he wants us to be faithful. He gives us money, and he wants us to be faithful and, and give some back. Mm -hmm. All that is is a lesson to teach us on how to steward things that God gives us. And money is very near and dear to man's heart, and so he starts with that. But he wants us to be faithful with everything he gives us, every gift he gives us, every relationship he gives us. Amen. That's right. 
every person that walks through these doors, he wants us to be faithful to. He wants us to be faithful with stewarding them. He wants God to be glorified in their lives. And he's choosing us to bring them to. And so we need to know how to steward that. Go with me to verse 42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and their possessions and were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. Mm. You see, mm. the ingathering is just the beginning. Mm. As he gathers people in, more fruit will become ripe and be gathered in also. These believers were earnestly desiring the things of God. They wanted more than anything to please him. They were diligent in their pursuit of God through prayer, persevering through trials. Tell me, what trials might come to you if you have that type of a lifestyle before the Lord? Health. You might have health trials. Strength. Yeah, because it takes strength to do, to be here, to make that commitment. I'll tell you, I have family members who aren't speaking to me. You know, there are trials that will come. And we need to persevere through them. We need to press into the face of Christ and rely on Holy Spirit. Are any of these obstacles too much for God to ask of you? No. Are they insurmountable for God? No. no. They're not. And yet, we cower in the face of them. And not even in the face of them, we cower in the possibility of what if. And so we just sit there and do nothing. Because what if so-and-so rejects me? Mm. Oh, I'd say you're in good company with Christ. Yeah. What if my body fails me? Hmm. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory. So your body might fail you. What if... I'm tired when I go to work. I think if you've given the time to God, he will give you the extra strength needed to do the job he's asked you to do. Amen. You see, none of them are insurmountable. See, when the Holy Spirit comes, he comes to those who know Jesus Christ. It's his gift to us. It's Christ's Holy Spirit. So you have to know him before you receive his spirit. Mm -hmm. Amen. So the first thing we ever need to say is, who is Christ? And am I willing to submit to his lordship? That's what Peter was helping them to see. Who is Christ and am I willing to submit to his lordship? Am I willing to listen? If so, there's things we need to learn and do in order to grow in him. And they're listed right here. Right here in these ones we read. Devoting yourselves to the apostles' teaching. Okay? Study the Word of God. What does the Word of God say about God and about our relationship to others? You know, have fellowship with one another. Mm -hmm. Get together. Following the service today, we have our fellowship meal. So have fellowship together. Stay in communion. We're going to have communion also. But remember, each time you remember Christ's death 
and resurrection, you proclaim his second coming. Amen. Amen. It's important for us to remember, oh, we get so forgetful. We look in the mirror and then we turn around and we forget what we even saw in the mirror. Maybe I looked in the mirror and saw that my earring was missing and I turn around and my mind's somewhere else and I go without one earring. <laughs> because we forget. We're forgetful people. We need to remember. We need to remember. Be intimate with him. And pray. You know, the quickest way, the quickest way to hinder, hamper, abort, or kill a move of God is to stop praying. Amen. We can't understand the leading of the Spirit if we're not willing to pray. That's why we fasted. That's why we prayed. Let me give you a few statistics. I'm almost done. Did you know only 10% of Spirit-filled believers pray at least 15 minutes a day in the Spirit? Only 15% pray less than 15 minutes a day in the Spirit. Another 7% pray weekly in the Spirit. About 50% of Spirit-filled believers, people who actually have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, maybe spoke in tongues at one time, maybe uh, manifested the gifts of the Spirit, whatever, about 50% of Spirit-filled believers never use the prayer language that they've been given. It's a lot. The remaining 22 would access the Holy Spirit only as they had need. You know, sort of like a fail-safe. Oh, I'm in this terrible situation. Maybe I, oh, I'm going to pray. Prayer is an offensive tool. So can you imagine this? I just want to take these statistics and I just want to apply them to the other room. Because I think when we have real numbers, that helps us to understand. Of the 120 in the upper room, according to these statistics, only 12 would have prayed at least 15 minutes a day. 12! How do you turn the world on its head if only 12 of you are praying? Well, the Spirit can do anything. But imagine. 18 would have at some time during the day prayed in tongues. 18. They would have spent a little bit of time. Eight would have prayed weekly in their prayer language. And 60 of that 120 would have failed to ever pray in the Spirit again. That's a high number. The remaining 22 would access Holy Spirit only as their circumstances would warrant it. That's those statistics. I'm not telling you you have to speak in tongues. I'm not telling you you have to have a prayer language. I'm not telling you any of that. What I'm telling you is you get to. You get to. You have the authority and the ability to move in the same spirit as, as those in the upper room. Amen. Can you imagine the change in you and in those around you? Can you imagine if you were to pray? As the Spirit led you, you see, everyone there kept feeling a sense of awe. God is an amazing and awesome God. He's amazing. He's awesome. And things will happen as we focus on Him. We must build to the Holy Spirit at all times. We must follow His leading. He is the Spirit of Christ. We need the wisdom of God. And when we pray, seeking Him, He will never be disappointed. Holy Spirit prayer is the doorway to a supernatural move of God. So, as our worship team comes forward, I just have a few questions that I think we need to ponder. <coughs> Are you and I, is Cornerstone, a lock or a key in the Spirit's move? 
You see, one will open a door, and one will shut a door that is unable to be opened. Keeps it securely shut. Are we a lock or a key to the Spirit's move? Are we a master gardener or a child playing in the dirt? So you have to actually spend time learning and studying with another master of the craft in order to get that craft. Mm -hmm. So are we a master gardener or are we just a child playing in the dirt? One produces a harvest. The other produces a mess. Mm -hmm. It's your choice. It's our choice. The Word of God is our foundation, but Holy Spirit supplies life. Mm -hmm. And the more we follow the leading of the Spirit, the greater will be the life flow in our meetings and in our time of assembly. If God, the same God that touched Peter, if God can use the 120 people in the upper room to turn the world on its head, what can he do here? What can he do with us? What can he do with you? We all have pockets of people that are just there for us to touch. Your pockets of people are different than mine. One of the things that we kept hearing in prayer was, you must be renewed and refreshed. You must be renewed and refreshed. We need Holy Spirit to bring a renewal, a refreshment inside our own heart so that we can steward that and bring that to those around us. You see, if we want to live, if we truly want to have life, we need to keep God first. Holy Spirit is like a sailboat. Without the wind, it's dead in the water. But with Him and the wind blowing, the wind of Holy Spirit, things happen. Things happen. I'm just going to ask you all, stand up where you are. Go ahead and just stand up where you are. Cheryl, you're the only one who gets a pass. Everyone else has to stand up. But I know you're standing on the inside. I know you. You're standing on the inside. Okay, and I'm going to just say, take your hands out of your pockets. Take both hands out of your pockets. Because God wants to do something. He wants to do something with you and I here at Cornerstone. First things first. Peter said to them, repent. And let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive Holy Spirit. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, now is the time. It's so simple. He's not complicated. He just says, you call out to me, you repent of your sins, and I will forgive you. You will be my child. You are my child. This is between you and God. For some of you, there might even be pictures going through your head of times you disappointed God, of times he said, go this way, go that way, and you said, I'm not moving from here. It is time to repent, church. Maybe you've received Christ as your Savior, but you've been on the road to nowhere. You've been relying on your own natural gifts. You've been relying on how smart you are in your intellect. You've been doing things that bring you your own self-satisfaction. It's time to get off the road to nowhere. It's time to get off of that road that leads to the garbage heap and get on God's road that leads to the throne room. 
You see, we were talking about this narrow road. And you know, the narrow road is not hard to walk if you're focused on Christ. Mm -hmm. If the Holy Spirit is living in you, the narrow road is not hard to walk. He doesn't demand too much. So we need to get off our own road to nowhere and onto his. So ask Jesus for forgiveness. Let's take a few moments. And if you need to come up front, that's fine. I thought about just telling everyone to come up front, but otherwise no one wants to move. But this needs to be between you and God. you just hold your hands up and receive Holy Spirit. Just breathe and receive. If words come to mind, just speak them out. If you feel something inside of you, just speak it out. Even if it's something you don't understand. You see, God wants to enable you to reap a harvest of souls, and he will do it through his spirit, by his spirit, through a yielded soul. So just breathe and receive and respond to him. 